Welcome, Ron, wherever you are. So it's a great pleasure to have Chan Chao uh, Li from Singapore speaking today to us. Chan Chao has done an impressive range of different works in machine learning and trying to understand the algorithms. Um, so trying to understand optimization algorithms. There's some very nice work on gradient descent and batch normalization he's done and on approximation theory, control theory, and his what I particularly like is uh, the link to dynamical systems. So Chan uh, Chao uses dynamical systems theory to try to understand algorithms by in this continuum time uh, approach and has done some beautiful work there. And we'll speak today how we can uh, use machine learning for dynamical systems as an application. And so please, uh, Chan Xiao. Thank you very much for the kind of introduction and the invitation for me to participate in this uh, workshop. So today I'm going to mainly talk about some mathematical questions and also applications of this deep learning for modeling the relationship between sequences, uh, which has a lot of uh, different types of applications ranging from traditional, you know, uh, prediction tasks to, to uh, you know, control uh, tasks and also to even, you know, modeling how the language uh, evolves uh, as, as, as we speak. So I put together a demo, uh, as uh, George said, that, uh, and you can access it. And uh, later I'll show uh, some uh, uh, simple demonstrations of what kind of problems we're interested in and also how machine learning can help us uh, provide some solutions uh, to those sequence modeling problems. Um, and on the theoretical part, I'll mainly talk about some very simple approximation theory one can uh, derive that sheds some light into uh, the inner workings of these machine learning algorithms for sequence modeling. So I'll, I'll start with a bit of background and then I'll go to uh, the, the demo. So I'm very interested in the broad connections between machine learning and dynamical systems. And there's, one can think of classifying them roughly as three categories of uh, interactions. So in the first category, uh, called machine learning via or by dynamical systems, this is where we try to use some uh, tools that we understand from dynamics, let's say, you know, differential equations, optimal control, uh, to try to understand certain aspects of machine learning, in particular, uh, deep learning in, in the modern era. So this includes, for example, dynamical formulations of deep learning and some approximation optimization theory, or you can also have dyna dynamical analysis of some learning algorithms. Like how can you use, uh, you know, how can you understand what's, uh, say, stochastic gradient descent doing, for example. And then um, on the other extreme, you can think of the doing the reverse, which is machine learning off dynamical systems. So this is where, um, you know, we try to learn some dynamical models uh, using a you know, data-driven sort of way from observations of very, possibly very complex dynamical systems. Um, this includes learning uh, reduced systems as well. And then um, more of today's topic is, is somewhere, you can think of it somewhere in the middle where we use uh, machine learning to, to, to help understand um, certain aspects of dynamical systems. It's not necessary to learn some dynamical equations, but uh, you know, to, for example, uh, reproduce or learn certain behaviors that arise from dynamics. So for example, time series forecasting is one example where the dynamics uh, produces the, the next value. You don't really need to know the dynamics to be able to say, uh, guess or learn the, 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 the value of the sequence, say in a future time, or we can uh, more generally, we can understand them as special cases of sequence to sequence models where um, you have an input sequence and an output sequence and there's some relationship between them. And how can you learn that relationship? So uh, I think this part is particularly interesting because it presents a very interesting interaction between uh, the dynamical structures in the data itself. Uh, itself for example, you know, the sequence that you're trying to model could come from an underlying dynamical system. And also um, the dynamical structures in the learning architectures because modern architecture usually has, uh, you know, for example, if we use some form of neural network, it's very deep. There's also an inherent dynamical structure in, in, in those models and how can they interact? Uh, you know, we'll find that the common theme is that when they are in some sense compatible, uh, then you have very good performance uh, in, your, in your models and, and vice versa. Okay, so uh, to introduce what is a basic sequence modeling problem. So um, here are some examples of sequence modeling problems. So uh, in the first one is probably the, 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 the most classical is to you know, predict uh, the future uh, uh, evolution of a of temporal sequence, right? So the x-axis here is the time and, and uh, you, your historical data is up to the present. And your goal is to uh, produce a sequence that up, uh, includes, of course, everything up to the present, uh, but also uh, some uh, segment into the future. 
Okay, so here is a, a prediction task that you can understand as a mapping to sequences. And then um, another task uh, that's of uh, a lot of practical importance is translation, right? So machine translation takes a sequence uh, here, you know, the index of the, the, the letters uh, or, or the words can be thought of as a time index. So you have a uh, time series of sort on the left in English and then the right hand side, you have the same time series in, in Chinese and they're supposed to have a, the same meaning, right? So this is translation and this is mapping one sequence to another as well. And another example that's probably more popular in engineering applications is control system. So imagine that we have a dynamical system uh, in, in the form of an ODE uh, that depends on uh, a external forcing or control, UT, okay? So if I give it a sequence of control like this, then you know, it will affect a certain change in the, in the dynamics you know, in the form of this output response. So this is again, a mapping between two sequences. Of course, all, all of this task is to say that if I give you many uh, demonstrations or samples of the input and output sequence, can you uh, use machine learning to try to approximate this mapping between the input and output so that it, when, when you have a new, uh, let's say, you know, prediction task, let's say a new control or new uh, uh, sentence, can you uh, use uh, the learned model to produce a, a corresponding output that is accurate? Okay. so. In, in the literature, in general literature, a lot of different uh, models or model architectures has been uh, proposed. Uh, most of this in very recent years, uh, except in RN, uh, to propose to solve this problem. Uh, and uh, the empirical evidence is actually quite mixed. So, so um, there are always problems where one architecture is better than another one. So a big problem in, in practical applications, let's say if you're a practitioner, is that there you have a zoo of models to choose from. All, all of whom, uh, all of which uh, can, you know, are, are, uh, can handle sequence to sequence mappings, but you know, depending on the problem, some of them will perform better than the others. Okay, so uh, from a mathematical viewpoint, uh, you know, it is really of uh, importance to understand, you know, how are these models actually different, and uh, what is their what's the relationship between their effectiveness and the kind of sequence relationships uh, you are trying to learn. Right, so when should you use which model for what applications? And, and, and we can only start to, to, uh, to tackle this problem if we understand some basics about what is really the difference in terms of these architectures for learning sequences. So that is the main motivation of the talk today. Um, so I wanna make uh, this a bit more concrete. So uh, we have a simple uh, notebook demonstration uh, and then uh, my student Hao Tian has uh, helped uh, me tremendously with this uh, demonstration. Okay, so uh, you can download this follow along or you can do it afterwards. So I'm gonna just show you this demo here. Okay, so if you open the Jupyter Notebook, this is what it uh, looks like. So hopefully the size is okay. Okay, so um, again, uh, this is just quickly demonstrate um, what, what kind of sequence, uh, sequence relationship one may be interested in. Uh, so here I give some qualitative examples, but let's look at a quantitative example. Okay, so the first, uh, sequence to sequence example. Uh, this is kind of a contrived example, but uh, it does illustrate some interesting behavior. So the simple problem is to shift the sequence. Okay, so you have, suppose you have an input sequence uh, of a bunch of numbers, the output would just be uh, shifting these numbers uh, to the right and then padding it with zero. Okay, so mathematically, you can understand this as a convolution uh, uh, between the original sequence and a, a, a dilated kind of, uh, delta function, it's a kernel. Okay, here, there is also a memory component here because you know, if you want to shift the sequence uh, far to the right, then you have to remember uh, more. So for example, uh, this point of the output sequence depends on three steps back, right? Because you shifted three steps. Uh, so there is a notion of a, a very basic notion of memory is that when you have a very large dilation uh, uh, rate uh, shifting size K, then your, your, the memory, uh, of uh, the, 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 the relationship increases, right? And this will have some very important effects uh, on training the model. Okay, so here's a simple uh, demonstration. So like you, I, I generate a bunch of data and you can, we can plot this. So this is uh, just some random input sequence. This is like a Gaussian process. And then um, we can shift it to the right by a number of units, say K equals 25. And you can see that this is the input output pair, right? It's very simple. It's just shifting the sequence and padding with zeros. Okay, so that's one example. Uh, and then taking this further, we can also think about uh, convolution of a sequence. Uh, so this is where we just take some function row 
and and we just convolve it with uh, this row is fixed, and then we convolve it with the input signal to get output signal, right? So this is very popular in signal processing. And here, for example, we can use a filter. Uh, this is a Gaussian filter, I believe, um, in in one D, and uh, we can give it a random kind of uh, input sequence, and this the output sequence will be a smooth version of the input sequence because it is a, a convolution of a Gaussian smoothing kernel, right? So we can look at a few uh, different inputs and outputs, right? So the effect is mostly smoothing. So that's another example. Um, okay, so then we can look at another sequence, the sequence example uh, data set, uh, which is a bit more complicated. So this is the Lorenz 96 system. So it's a, it's a, it's a system of ODEs uh, proposed by uh, Lorenz in 96 to uh, model uh, as some a somewhat minimal model that produces a very complex behavior, like chaotic behavior. Okay, so this is a system of ODEs. Uh, of, uh, so these parameters K and J will determine how big these uh, ODEs are. And uh, we can think of uh, the inputs as some forcing to this ODE. Okay, so uh, it's like a force that's applied to one of the, uh, uh, one of the variables Y. And then we can observe what is the uh, output uh, sequence variable i. So the input x and output is y. Okay, so then we can program this. So here I only imported the library because it's, 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 it, we have uh, we have written the code in the back end to do this. So you can take a look at the, the, the code that the, in, in the repository to show how we, 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 we uh, done this. This is just a data generation process. Okay, so we're going to plot this. Okay, so here. Uh, your input sequence again, like a smooth Gaussian process, um, and and this this sequence will will change the way that this y uh, uh, response uh, looks. For example, for one, for one particular um, here we, we set k equals to one, so there's only one equation. But in general, there's going to be many many equations, and you can see that this there there is certainly some correspondence between the input and output, right? The fluctuations does affect them, but of course the relationship seems quite. Uh, complicated. It's not easy to model it using some simple, you know, transform. So this is where machine learning can come in to try to understand what is the relationship between this input curve and, and the output curve. Okay. And the next one uh, is is text generation. So this is a, a one of the you know kind of the toy examples for natural language processing. So uh, this is you know a sequence prediction task of sort. Uh, the the uh, the idea is that if you have an input um, input text, okay, of a of a sentence, and then the uh, the 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 goal is to generate some output um, text that starts from here and uh, and goes on for for quite a quite a bit, so a longer uh, sequence, um, using some yeah algorithm uh, machine learning model that's trained on some data set maybe uh, to generate uh, a text that looks like what you see in the data set so here this example we show uh, this this generator is actually done using a machine learning model that's trained on uh, the shakespeare uh, plays data set so you can see that no matter what i start with uh, you will usually end up <laughs> like like a play right? so this is just gibberish like if you read it it doesn't make any sense but um, the form of the text uh, does uh, makes sense okay and this is a character level generation that means uh, it's not generating one word at a time it's generating characters so you can see that most a lot of the uh, the words are actually uh, correct uh, correctly spelled of course there's probably wrong ones so and you can test this using like uh, you know even if i put a, a, a actual text right i think this is part of the training uh, this is 12 nice uh, opening sentence but uh, it's, it's, it's going to slowly generate uh, one word at a time. Uh, okay, so once he has, uh, okay, this is refreshing. Okay, and, and, and it's generating some text that's definitely not the original text. So here, uh, uh, of course, our, our goal is not to match a deterministic sequence between an input and output sequence, but rather uh, we are trying to match the character probabilities. Uh, so if I, given that I have this history, then the next character, should have high probability of being a you know let's say after love this should be either a space or a line break right so this model does achieve that okay so the goal is to map the input sequence which is the linear sequence to an output probability uh, sequence okay okay so these are just some examples of the visualization of the data set um, and 
what, what I'm going to do next is to, to show you some ways of building a machine learning model to train on some of these data sets and observe you know, what, what uh, some characteristics of this performance. Okay. By the way, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to interrupt me. And... Okay, so the simplest architecture for sequence to sequence modeling is the recurrent neural network. It's one of probably one of the oldest um, methods. So here's the idea of how you can model an input sequence, a relationship between input sequence and output sequence through machine learning. What we can do is to build a new recurrent neural network whose equation uh, looks like this. Okay, here the time is discrete for simplicity. Then um, this x t is your input sequence. Okay, so if you look at the graph here, what I, what 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 I'm doing here is that uh, I define a bunch of hidden states, which which is called h. Okay, and this hidden state evolves according to a certain dynamical system. Okay, so this first equation is the dynamical system for these hidden states. Now, at each step of, uh, of time, the input sequence will be fed into this hidden dynamics as a forcing term. Okay, so this forces the dynamics, so we'll change the dynamics. And the output is just a measurement, okay, a simple, like, for example, a linear measurement of this hidden state. Okay, and uh, and you can see that uh, you know, by just defining the dynamics of a hidden state and maybe some, some simple measurement vectors, C, okay, W, U, and B, uh, I can parameterize a relationship between an input sequence and output sequence. Okay? And the training of the neural network or this recurrent neural network is simply changing these weights and biases and this, uh, this output vector uh, so that this sequence to sequence mapping becomes what you really want uh, in your applications. Okay, uh, and uh, to do this uh, here, I give you a very simple um, um, implementation of this uh, in, in PyTorch, uh, which I guess is self-explanatory. So we, we, we define all those weight uh, and, and biases using uh, uh, you know, the, the usual API. So if you are familiar with Python, you, you probably don't need explanation, but if not, then, you know, you can take this uh, example uh, as, as, as a simple example to implement uh, what we described above, okay, which is the, the, the forward method is basically the method that uh, drives this equation, okay? So we, we can implement this here, and now we can test uh, its performance, okay? So what we're going to do uh, is to train this on the uh, on Lorentz, uh, uh, model. And uh, here I'm only going to um, uh, show you the results because the training takes a while. So I've, I've in the repository as well saved some checkpoints of the training, but the training code is also inside uh, and, and show you the, the performance. Okay. So, so here's the, the, the result of the, the trained model in uh, recurrent neural network. So here I only plot the output. The output is the ground truth and the prediction is the prediction by the recurrent neural net. I didn't plot the input sequence here for simplicity. So if you uh, refresh it a few times, you can see that um, you know for different inputs, uh, my prediction is uh, is pretty pretty good, right? Acceptable for recurrent nets. Okay. Can I interrupt and ask a question? Yes, please. Um, what are your training data? What are your observations? Is it? Yeah. So the observations are, are, are this Why? one. So in the Lorentz. Okay. So these are the input and the output. Oh, it's the so, force. It's where you look for the response. Correct. So the input sequence and the response sequence. Of the multi-scale uh, Lorentz 96 that you had before. Okay. Yeah, it's like a mul it's multiple like uh, here and the input is like a forcing to one of the equations and I observe the Y values. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So for simplicity, I only plot the one dimensional case, but the code handles any dimension. Yeah. It's hard to plot more dimensions. Okay. So, so RN performs uh, relatively uh, well here. But if you really look at the training dynamics, some very interesting things happen. Okay, so if you look at the loss curve, so here I plot, uh, this is your um, uh, training uh, uh, epochs, okay, iterations, and here is your loss. Okay, so this is basically the distance between your prediction and your ground truth. And it has a very, uh, you know, like a plateauing kind of behavior where you will go, uh, go flat for a while and then you will, you will go down. And the same also happens if you train this uh, uh, on, on a different task. Like for example, if you train this recurrent neural network on um, on the, uh, the the shift the shift task, you know, you shift the sequence, okay? And it also something like that happens. And in fact, you can understand this um, uh, why this happens using some uh, 
uh, detailed analysis of the optimization dynamics. So I won't have time to talk about this effect, uh, but you can take a look at our paper uh, on this. Okay, so uh, we can also look at the, 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 the performance of this uh, RN on, on the shift sequence, okay? So this is where uh, the output will be an input sequence shifted to the right by 25 units. Again, the input will be the original sequence and the, sorry, the training data will consist of pairs of sequences, one with the original input and one with the shifted input, right? And then we'll try to reproduce that. So this is the ground truth again, and, and the prediction is here. So you can see that um, the, the, the performance is fine, but of course it's much worse than, to, than the, uh, well, for some of the cases, it is uh, noticeably worse uh, than the, uh, uh, the smooth kind of Lorentz system. Okay, for some of the, for example, here. Um, and, and if you reduce the size of the recurrent neural networks, uh, of, I forgot to say what is the size of the recurrent neural network. The size of the recurrent neural network is basically the dimension of your hidden states here. Okay, so if you have many, many dimensions of hidden states, uh, then this is a large network. And you, and you will, it turns out that this is an important quantity that controls the complexity of your model. Okay. Can I interrupt again? Sorry. Yes, please. The accuracy will depend on the length of the shift, right? So if you have just the shift of one, yes. the system yes. is Markov and yes. the map doesn't exist. So, exactly. Um, how, how does it manifest if you just, you know, there'd be a training error at the function of the shift? The training problem will become harder as, as your shift becomes longer. So this, this plateau actually becomes longer uh, when, the, when the shift becomes longer. And the, the error is, is worse as, you, as your shift becomes longer. Yes, you, you can take a look at the code. Uh, you, you can reproduce that. And, and, and in this paper, actually, uh, we, 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 we analyze why it does that. So you can prove that this will happen. Would you be able to detect that um, it is fundamentally not possible to um, get a map by just um, training error? That's a good question. I think in general, it's hard to detect this because it's in probably a numerical property, right? So. Um, uh, what we can show in the linear case is that this recurrent neural network can, is, is dense in the space of linear functionals. Later, I will talk about that result. Uh, but in general, uh, nonlinear functionals, of course, is much harder to talk about. So if, when I say functional, I mean the mapping between the input sequence and the output value uh, at a particular time. This is what we are functional, right? Uh, and um, I think in general, it's not known whether this is dense in, in, in what collection of nonlinear functionals. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And now I want to take some time to talk about some other ways of modeling sequences that has become more and more uh, popular these days, uh, mostly from the application viewpoint. So uh, one particular uh, idea is that we know that convolution neural networks has been very successful uh, in image applications. And naturally people thought, okay, can I use convolution type of ideas, co deep convolutional networks uh, to model sequence relationships? So one, one uh, very uh, famous example, this is a network proposed by uh, Google to do their uh, text-to-speech or speech-to-text uh, task. In fact, that's what I think they would use nowadays in Android. So if you have an input sequence and an output sequence, for example, the input sequence could be a sound sequence and output, you want it to be a transcription of the words, okay? Uh, and Instead of doing feeding this as an input of some hidden dynamical system, like uh, you know the recurrent neural network and reading it out as output, what I can simply do is do a causal convolution of uh, the input sequence. So if you take a look at the final point of the output, how is this point computed by my network? Well, I'm just going to use a size two uh, convolution uh, filter with 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 a stride two. So it's going to take this two, convolve it, get this value, this two, get this value. Okay, and then in the next layer, I'm going to use another convolution filter or many convolution filters and with a different stride. Uh, so this is called dilated convolution. So I, I only convolve this two and then I skip again. And this will give me the next layer of convolution. And I'm going to do another convolution, another convolution. And in the end, um, this one will be, uh, will be computed using the sequence of convolutions. So of course, if you only use convolutions, it's going to be a linear relationship. So what people usually do is to uh, put some nonlinearities between each of these convolution operations, just like what you would do in the, uh, the image networks. Okay, so the only difference between this is, is uh, to the images is that uh, you do a causal one. That means that you only convolve with the past. So, so this value will not depend on anything in the future, for example. Um, and you do a, a dilated convolution. So you can um, go many layers without, uh, without having too much uh, cost in, in terms of computation. 
Okay, so people have shown that this is very successful in like, for example, uh, word to speech, speech to word uh, kind of applications. But nevertheless, you know, we don't know, you know, is this fundamentally better than recurrent neural networks and when, okay? So here we can do some experiments. And, and of course, uh, in this paper, which I'll talk about uh, a little bit later, we, we have some precise understanding of why, how this is different from the, the, the recurrent neural network. Okay, so uh, what we can do is to train, again, this, this kind of network architecture on, let's say, the Lorentz uh, task, okay? So you can see the training curve no longer has this plateauing behavior, which is uh, good news. And we can take a look at uh, the result. Okay, so you can see that although the training doesn't, you know, plateau, the results is maybe not as good as your um, recurrent neural network uh, counterpart, okay? Uh, the recurrent neural network for the Lorentz system seems to work very well, okay? If you look at this. However, we can, we can train the shift problem using convolution network and let's see what happens. So this is the result and for different inputs. You can see that uh, this is pretty much perfect other than very small artifacts here and there due to uh, probably training problems. Uh, and, and it's not hard to understand why, right? Because uh, the, rec the, the, the network architecture here, in fact, uh, includes uh, the shift operator, which is the convolution. Uh, so, so it is within this model space, right? So that's technically no approximation error at all if you, train, you can train things properly. So what we can see from these two experiments is that we have two examples. One is the Lorentz system, which seems to have a smooth relationship between your input and output with maybe possibly not too much memory. And then you have your uh, shift sequence, which whose memory component is comp con controlled by K. And there's some non-smoothness uh, between this input and output, okay? Uh, and let me just ask quickly. Yeah. Uh, so, in your diagram of the CNN above, here, yes. So there's no overlap in. So, it, like your diagram kind of says that, um, you know, nothing, nothing survives into higher levels more than once. So there's no overlaps of the um, convolutions. Um, yeah, so in this dilated, I guess when you say overlap, you mean uh, there's this node is not like this two does not interact through here, right? Yeah, yeah but they do interact through, through here. So this is like the dilated convolution they, they proposed. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so, so, so in terms of this interaction, yes, this, this two nodes only interact with these two nodes at the, this layer, not mm -hmm. at this layer. Yeah. But in, 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 uh, in the, if you look at it, this one is still affected by all of them. And, yeah. and any two of them will interact at some point. Yeah, and, and here, this is like one convolution filter, but in general, of course, I'm gonna have a, a many channels of convolution filter and, and we'll have some summation at every step to mix the different channels. Yeah, so that's where the complexity arises. Okay, so to summarize the finding uh, of this is that, for these two problems, we have applied uh, convolution net and also the, uh, the, the, sorry, the dilated convolution net and also the recurrent net. And we saw that for one problem, uh, the recurrent net is better for the, for the Lorentz system. And for the shift sequence one, the convolution one is better. Okay, so clearly from an experimental point of view, you cannot really say one architecture is fundamentally better than another. We really need to understand, you know, why is it that it sometimes is better? There must be something to do with the, 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 some compatibility issues between your model and the data that you're trying to learn. And the last demonstration that I want to show is like a, a very uh, uh, popular architecture recently that has been uh, demonstrated to be very successful for uh, a lot of applications. So this is called the transformer network. And you can take a look at the paper that I'll introduce this. Uh, it's very popular in uh, natural language processing. So the, the structure is, is quite complicated, okay? But uh, the, the important uh, thing it's, uh, there are two important uh, innovations in, in this new network. One is the presence uh, of an encoder and decoder kind of architecture. So this is where, uh, this belongs to a family of, of, of sequence relationships where you map one sequence to another by first encoding the input sequence into a vector, right? And then you decode the vector into another sequence. So the good thing about doing this is that the input sequence and output sequence, you know, they can be globally coupled together, right? And uh, there's really, um, you, they can, you can handle sequence of different lengths, for example, using this approach. And another approach in, in, in uh, another uh, novelty in, uh, in this uh, kind of architecture is uh, attention mechanism, okay? And they allow you to focus on certain parts of the sequence at a time. 
So I won't have time to talk about the details of these, but I'll just show you the demo. So I can train uh, a, a transformer uh, and on those two problems. And here's what happens. So this is your shift uh, sequence problem. Okay, so this is a small transformer. If you increase the size, of course, this is gonna get better. But what you observe <laughs> is very interesting is that this no longer produces a smooth sequence. So in some sense, I, I, I am approximating the sequence in, in let's say, Niao 2, but not in H2, for example. Uh, and the same thing goes for the Lorentz system, okay? So it seems to be able to handle these two systems uh, simultaneously, but uh, it, it approximates in a very different way. And this has something to do with the way that the attention works, okay? Uh, and later in the talk, if I have time, I will talk a little bit about uh, what is what we can understand about this kind of encoder decoder architectures, uh, but the attention uh, part of this uh, is, is, is still uh, you know, ongoing. This, this uh, is, is a slightly uh, different kind of problem. Okay, so this is just for, for your interest. And uh, you can, of course, all these implementations is available. Uh, and uh, okay, so that's all I wanna show uh, for the demo. Is there any final questions before you go to some uh, simple uh, mathematical results? Okay, so to, to analyze this problem mathematically, I think it's useful to uh, uh, formulate what kind of questions uh, we can ask and then uh, in, in, in what sense is it different from, let's say, from a static problem. So here are all examples of supervised learning, right? So you have, what is supervised learning is you have some input data. It could be like an image or a time series, and then you have some output, right? In the case of uh, image classification, this will be some uh, labels. Uh, well, corresponding to the class of the image. And it could be, you know, for time series prediction, it would be the future time series. Okay, and the, the premise is that we have some pairs of this data and we assume that there's some relationship underlying it that maps the inputs to the outputs. And our goal is to learn or approximate this target function or functional F star or operator in general. Okay, so what's different in the dynamic setting or when you talk about sequences is the following. So in the static setting, you can think the X for each sample, X is just a, um, a vector, okay? It can be a flattened pixels of the image. So it's a finite dimensional vector. And, and an output is also a vector. Okay, this could be vectors of class probabilities, for example. And the target is just an ordinary function that maps a vector space to another vector space, uh, a Euclidean space. So the dynamic setting is very different. So the input is not just one vector, but you can think of it as a sequence of vectors indexed by K. So, and this K can be finite, infinite, or you know, even continuous, you know, not even discrete. And the output is also a sequence, okay? So the K is, 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 is again, um, stands for temporal index. And you have not just one target function, but a sequence of target functions. So at each point of K, right? this value yk could potentially depend on the entire sequence of inputs, right? Or at least entire sequence of inputs up to some time k, right? So that's the causal kind of relationships. So what we will need to model is actually just a sequence of uh, index by k uh, relationships functions or in, in, in the case where uh, x is infinite dimensional it'd be functions. So in the static setting, we want to learn approximate f, but in the dynamic setting, we need to learn and approximate the sequence of functionals, hk. Okay, and this is where a lot of the interesting stuff comes up. Okay, so before going to the results, well, what kind of mathematical questions we can ask about this, uh, this, this problem or supervised learning problems in general. So here we have some, uh, so the way we do supervised learning, of course, we have a target we're trying to approximate. So what, how, how do we approximate this target? We first define some hypothesis space. So this is where all this is a space of all kinds of um, you know candidate functions that you think could model the relationship, and you try to find the best one in this, right? So it, it could be a set of polynomials or you know neural networks and whatnot. So the most basic question we can ask is how big this hypothesis space is. In particular, what is the best possible model in my hypothesis space that gets as close to to the target as possible? So the error between your best model and your target is called the approximation error. And to study how this approximation error depends on the properties of the target and the size of your hypothesis space, let's say complexity, uh, is, is, is the problem of approximation. And this is gonna be the focus of today's talk. But this is not the only question one can ask. So because even if I tell you there's a very good model here that's very close to the target, uh, if I don't tell you how to find it, uh, that, that's useless, right? So, the second problem is that how do you, how do you learn this model? So it's, suppose that you start from some initial guess in your hypothesis and we have to train or usually, form, uh, usually uh, formulate it as an optimization problem. Uh, this uh, initial guess to somewhere, what's called a learned model that's hopefully closer to the best model than the initial guess. 
Okay, but of course, this there's still a gap here. So why? There's two reasons. The first reason is because the opti this optimization problem cannot be solved precisely, right? This is not a you know a closed form solution. You have to use some iterative algorithm that goes for a finite number of steps. So you always have this optimization error. And the distance between your learned model and the best possible uh, model that minimizes your empirical risk. So this is where, the, you, in some sense, you maximize the performance in your training set. So there's a distance between them, and this is optimization error. And, and finally, uh, this empirical risk minimizer and the best model is still different because your empirical risk minimizer depends on your training set, which is finite. So you only have a finite number of observations from which the best model that fits those observations need not be the best model uh, in general, okay? And the gap, of course, uh, is, is called generalization error and it decreases as your number of samples, uh, training samples increase. So there's a, so from target, for the target to learn model, right? So we have three errors that are, that are contributing uh, to the distance, the approximation, optimization, and generalization. And I think it's quite interesting in that uh, each of these errors has been the focus uh, of the study of uh, different fields of mathematics. It, it, for example, in the approximation uh, theory, uh, approximation error, for example, apply harmonic analysis for analysis, at least it began by studying how close you can get to a particular function by expanding it, let's say, uh, in terms of uh, basis functions, right? So this is a approximation error. And, and then uh, in statistics, usually one studies the sample complexity estimates in the form of generalization error, okay? And of course, the optimization theory studies, you know, how if you have you know n steps of optimizer uh you know gradient descent or whatever how how close you can get to the to the to the minimum so all of these are different fields of mathematics and and, and machine learning offers a, a, a one scenario where all of them contribute together um uh, to the analysis okay and today i'm going to focus mostly on the first one so let's um formalize what is the problem of approximation um, so given some hypothesis space H, you can think of it as a space of functions or functionals, and the target, sometimes in statistics, is called a concept space, target space C, okay? So this, this is where your target lives in. And there's two kinds of approximation results one can ask. The first one is the most basic. It's called universal approximation, okay? Uh, so what does universal approximation mean? If, if I have universal approximation of some concept space C, it means that for each H star, this target function or functional in C, uh, there exists, uh, and, and some error tolerance epsilon, we can always find a model in our hypothesis space H hat, such that uh, the distance between uh, these two, okay, in some norm is smaller than or equal to epsilon. In some sense, uh, your, 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 your hypothesis space is dense in this concept space uh, in, in this norm. Okay, so this tells us this guarantees that you know if our hypothesis space is good enough to learn this concept, okay. And the second problem is a more fine-grained version of the first one. Uh, this has to do with approximation rates. So assume that your hypothesis space H can be written uh, as a union uh, of a different hypothesis of budget or size M. So this M is a measure of how complex the hypothesis space is, okay. And so it's an increasing uh, sequence. So we sometimes also call it approximation budget, okay? And a result, uh, result in the form of approximation rates basically says that if I take any H star in, in C and I find the best approximation uh, error within my hypothesis space, but with a limited budget M, then how fast does this uh, error go down as a function of M? So they usually de depend on two things. One is the complexity of my target, okay? And one is, you know, how, how, how big is my M? And this rate uh, usually goes to zero. Well, it has to go to zero when M goes to infinity for, for, for this to, to hold, right? So if I have some expression like this, I can understand what kind of H star is easy to approximate, right? If the complexity measure is low, uh, then, you know, we know that the error is small. So this tells us a, a lot about the inner workings of this kind of approximation uh, 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 procedure. Okay, so to, to give you a familiar example, um, this is a very classical problem that people have studied. Uh, it's approximation of functions by trigonometric polynomials, like Fourier kind of series, right? Uh, so here, our space, concept space C, can be the periodic uh, alpha smooth uh, functions on, on zero to two pi, 
okay, these are scalar functions. And uh, I can try to approximate these kind of functions by a trigonometric polynomial okay, of order m. So this is just sums of uh, sines and cosines up to order m. Okay, so then we have the following result uh, due to uh, Jackson. Uh, in, uh, this is a very classical result that says that the best approximation error you can get of any function h star is given by the following form, uh, which is what we said before, right? The, uh, the complexity of h star is simply uh, the, the, the norm, okay, of uh, h star and its derivatives. Okay, so if h star is a very smooth function uh, in this concept space, uh, then this number is small, right? If it's a very zigzaggy function, this number is very big. And then m, m to the alpha is the rate. Okay, so alpha is the smoothness of this function. And this is a polynomial kind of uh, rate uh, to, 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 towards zero. Okay, so we, this is an example of what, uh, you know, so the, what does this tell us? This tells us the insight is that efficient approximation by trigonometric polynomials uh, is, uh, can, can happen if h star is smooth and has small gradient norm. Right, so smooth functions, flat functions are easy to approximate using these guys. Um, and so the, the whole goal of uh, the, the following analysis I'm gonna talk about is to derive similar statements to the Jackson theorem, but this time where C is suitable classes of sequence relationships that we talked about before, you know, between you know, in, uh, you know, two sentences, for example. And H can take a variety of forms, for example, recurrent neural networks, or the CANs, which uh, WaveNet is one example that we talked about before, or encoder decoder kind of architectures, or even more complex ones that combines these ideas like transformers, okay? And for each case, what we want to show is that what kind of concepts, a concept space, or like what kind of target relationships can be approximated, what, can, how, and what kind of targets can be approximated efficiently using each of these hypotheses, and how does the complexity measure and the rate estimate depend on the hypothesis space? All right. And of course, all of this, uh, this, this understanding will help us uh, choose you know, which H uh, to use in practice for what problems. Okay, so that's the ultimate uh, practical goal. Speaking to functions that go uh, into R, so you I mean, like normally you would, if in, in higher dimensions, it's not just one on M on alpha, but one on M on alpha divided by the dimension. Co correct, correct. So yeah, here, this is a one okay. dimensional. Are you addressing that as well or? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so our results later will have the D that that's in the input dimension. Uh, so in general, um, we know that this kind of approximation, uh, when you generalize high dimensional space using tensor products is gonna suffer from the cursor dimensionality. Um, and I will talk about, you know, this, this I will expect this to hold for generic uh, functionals as well. But in our case, we will analyze most of them in linear functionals, which this doesn't happen because different dimensions can be treated separately. Okay, thank you. But there's another kind of curse that comes out of it <laughs> that has to do with the temporal domain. Okay, so um, I'll talk about, to answer this approximation questions, I'll talk in some detail about the, the first kind of classical networks called recurrent neural networks and, and then how would those results look like for those networks. So to recall, uh, we have seen this demo already, right? So you have a recurrent neural network. What it does is to define a hidden dynamical system, H, and the input sequence will be a forcing to the system and the output sequence will be a measurement of the system. Okay, in the simple case, linear measurement. So we can see that this RNN parameterized a sequence of functions uh, from uh, fun functions from, from this input sequence up to this time uh, K and to the output, right? And we can, for analysis say we can also look at a continuous time idealization where we change this k to a continuous parameter t and replace this difference equation by a differential equation okay so this is the uh, the differential equation just uh, you know same form and uh, this is not just a con it's just idealization in practice this is also used for a lot of applications where this time series of input and output are in fact sampled continuously and at irregular intervals so uh, then you really cannot uh, use this kind of uh, you know, equal time interval uh, uh, formulation and you, you, it's better to use a continuous time formulation uh, where you have irregularly sample time series. So this, for example, has a lot of uh, applications in my like ECG analysis. So uh, I want to note that here we are talking about uh, approximation of the uh, results of the mapping between X and Y, 
Okay, not the approximate mapping of this dynamical system between, let's say, the initial condition of H and the terminal condition of H. This one has more to do with the dynamical view on deep neural networks, where there is some approximation theory that we have worked on as well uh, in, in, in this regard, but it's not really uh, the same thing. <laughs> We're talking about something different. So empirically, it is found uh, that recurrent neural networks performs very poorly when modeling some long-term memory. And this term has been thrown around a lot in, in practical literature, but what does it precisely mean? And why does RN work bad? Uh, work, uh, not, it doesn't work well, it works poorly uh, when, when you have this kind of memory structures uh, is, is, uh, is unknown. Okay, so our goal is to investigate this more precisely, but for, of course, in a simplified setting. Okay, so what we're gonna do is to make a drastic uh, um, simplification where we assume that uh, the activation function of my, uh, my uh, recurrent neural network is linear, so it's identity, okay? Because the linear token can be uh, absorbed into this matrix. And then we'll have a linear dynamical system. And, and you can see that, uh, we'll see that empirically, this still uh, preserves much of the characteristics of the original system. So the nice thing about doing this assumption is that now, um, or simplification, is that now this uh, dynamics can be exactly solved and you can uh, actually show uh, that the relationship between x, this input sequence uh, uh, time series, and y hat, uh, it has an explicit form, okay? So we can write out what is the RN, uh, linear RN hypothesis space. So this is the group of functionals where each of this functional at time t is written as a convolution between your input time series with a kernel that looks like a sum of exponentials. So this, this is e to the ws. This term arises because of this linear dynamics, right? It has an exponential solution. And we are going to consider uh, a special case uh, where this uh, weight matrix W has uh, negative uh, real pass, or uh, it's sometimes called Hurwitz matrices. Uh, the reason is that if this is not true, then this functional you can show that it's not continuous. Okay, so we want, we want it to be a, a nice continuous function. Okay, so here's the calculate. So, so the, uh, okay, sorry, the, this, this should not be a union here. So HM of RN, so this is your RN hypothesis space with budget M, is simply this kind of uh, sequence of functionals where uh, W has negative uh, real uh, pass as eigenvalues. And of course, these matrices are of uh, size M. Okay, so D is the input dimension and M is the hidden dimension. This is the budget, uh, how big your, your network is. Okay, so there's no, uh, no union here, sorry. Okay, so this is a hypothesis we're interested in uh, looking at. And immediately one, one can check uh, that there are some properties of this hypothesis space. Um, for example, for each of these uh, linear RNs, uh, this parameterizes a continuous linear function. Okay, this, this should be uh, obvious. Uh, moreover, it is a causal functional in the sense that the value the eight for, for each t, the output only depends on time series up to this point t. It doesn't depend on any future time. Okay, which is also obvious if you look at the structure of the network, right? It doesn't read into future times. Um, the next one is, is a regular functional. So I didn't put a definition here. Roughly, it just means that this, uh, it, it, this, 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 this function is, it, you know, is, is a continuous. So um, if you give it a, a signal that it has a spike uh, and this, the width of the spike goes infinitely thin, then the, the, the output of this functional uh, should not be changed. Okay, so it's like an inter interpretability kind of condition. Uh, and finally, uh, this, this property is that this family of functionals here is time homogeneous. That means if I shift the input sequence by amount, then the output sequence also shifts by the same amount. And they, they remain unchanged up to this shift because it's shifting equivariant. And this is of course uh, true because if you look at the dynamics, uh, this dynamics has no special points in time. So this W, U, and C are not depending on T. So therefore, if you shift the input sequence, you just shift the output sequence. So these are the pro properties of this uh, recurrent neural network you can immediately uh, observe uh, from, from, from this uh, expression. Okay, so the first main result uh, it is, is the fact that these are you know, necessarily uh, true, but it turns out that any uh, functional that satisfies these properties can be approximated by a recurrent neural networks up to arbitrary accuracy. Okay, so this is the first result. Uh, we assume that any uh, you know, family of continuous linear causal regular time homogeneous functionals, uh, then you know, we can in fact approximate each of these functionals by a sufficiently wide uh, recurrent neural network. 
uh, up to any arbitrary accuracy. And this norm is in the soup norm uh, for both time and, and, and the input. All right, so, so this is a density result as we recalled earlier. And, and the idea is very simple. So uh, to prove this, all you need to show is that this H star, this family satisfying these properties has a common, this family of function has a common risk representation uh, row. Okay, uh, so you can be represented in this form. And this row has certain you know, uh, regularity properties. And if you recall, our RNN hypothesis space is also of this form, except this row has a particular form of exponential sum. So C transpose E to the WS U. This uh, is an approximator of some integral function row. And so the RNN approximation in this uniform sense reduces to an L1 approximation of this row by, uh, by this exponential sum for which we can derive uh, some density results on. So the nice thing about analyzing linear systems is linear functionals are like functions, right? So uh, we, we can do uh, things with it. Sorry, um, would you be able to repeat the definition of time homogeneous? Yeah, so time homogeneous uh, means that if we shift this X, uh, the time index of the input sequence uh, by say tau amount, then the, uh, the output sequence is, is unchanged if you shift the output sequence by the same amount. Okay. Right. So if you shift the sequence in time, the output sequence also shifts equivalently. Right. Thank you. Yeah. So this is this is true because the the dynamics is time invariant. Okay. So so this is the kind of uh, basic guarantee that says that okay, in this setting, recurrent neural networks is, is enough. Okay. To approximate any linear function, but of course this is not very interesting because it doesn't really tell us what kind of functions are easy to approximate using recurrent neural networks, and that turns out to be a much more interesting question. So after the density, we can look at rates. So it turns out that the approximation rates depends on, just like the, in the Jackson theorem for polynomial approximation, it depends on some properties of the function. And here, the properties we can identify, uh, it, uh, the key properties are smoothness and memory. Now the smoothness is not that interesting, but the memory part is interesting. So here I give a, a graphical illustration of what, what I mean by smoothness and memory. So here on the left and on the right, you can see two families of uh, functionals, okay? Uh, on, the, on the left, oh, so I'm gonna give you the same input signal. So this is of course a cartoon, right? So the same input signal and the, right hand, the left-hand side signal produces this kind of output signal, whereas the right-hand side produces this one. So what's the difference? The first difference is that if you observe, the input signal is kind of smooth, smoothly varying in time, okay? And for the left-hand side, the first case, the output is also smoothly varying in time, but the same cannot be said for the right-hand side. Okay, so that's the first difference. And the second difference is that if you see that this time series stops changing like halfway through it, okay, it has become flat. And if you look at the time, uh, the output time se series, this also stops changing around the same time, okay? So in other words, the response uh, is not really uh, remembering something that's very far away from this input sequence, okay? Or possibly not very far away. But on the right-hand side, this same input sequence has stopped changing, but the output is still like kind of fluctuating uh, wildly. So it must, in some sense, be responding to something uh, before, right? Because this has stopped changing. So we can see that um, the right hand side is reasonable to say the right hand side has some long memory and it's probably not very smooth. <laughs> okay, so this is the, the, the cartoon. And what we can show, it turns out the result is that. This kind of functions are hard to approximate using recurrent neural networks, but this kind is. So how can we formalize uh, the, this, this kind of notions? So what we can do is to, to define, how do we characterize the smoothness of this, this map and the memory? So what we can do is to define some constant signals or like a heavy side kind of signals, okay? Where is one if uh, T is greater than zero or zero otherwise, and E is the standard basis in RD, okay? So these are just some constant uh, heavy side signals. Um, then, given a family of functionals, we can look at the, the effect or the output of the functional on these kind of test signals. So the smoothness of this functional, H star, we can characterize it by the smoothness of the mapping between T and the output of this signal, uh, this functional on this kind of heavy side signal, okay, kind of constant signals. And the memory is also characterized by the decay of the derivatives of this mapping. Right, so if the derivatives decay very quickly, that means it is not really remembering because the constant signal has no, no change, right? And if this decays very quickly, uh, then we say that it has small memory. So you can check that this kind of 
uh, definition is consistent with this observation. Okay, so we can define smoothness and memory by the action of these functionals on some time uh, constant signals. So with this uh, definition, we can then prove a, a rate result much like the Jackson's uh, theorem. So uh, the statement is a bit complicated, but maybe I'll just highlight to you the one important uh, assumption here is that we assume that this memory component, which is the derivative of this action on con uh, of this functionals on constant signals, if it decays like, like exponential, okay, with exponential rate beta, right? If it decays like the exponential, uh, then we can derive this rate. Okay, so this is the assumption uh, of the of the uh, of, of, on the family H star. So this has to be O one. Okay, we, if this is O one, then the right hand side you, you can you can then define the, um, the kind of a norm uh, on the derivative, uh, and this gamma is basically the norm. Okay. Uh, and once we have this, you can we can show uh, a positive rate uh, in the following. And of course, we assume that this uh, this response is also in C alpha plus one. So this is like uh, sufficiently smooth. So this is very similar uh, to to the uh, Jackson type of result. And and, and let's take a look at um, th this result in more detail. So this this is our rate estimate. This is given a budget m. Uh, my uh, my rate uh, my approximation error is going to decay like m to the alpha, but exactly the same as uh, as the the uh, Jackson's theorem. But what's different here uh, is the memory dependence. So we assume that this memory has to decay exponentially with some rate beta, and then you, this will result in the corresponding norm of that uh, kind of decay uh, gamma. Okay, and with this tool, you, you, can, you can estimate this rate. Uh, there's no curse of dimensionality here to address the previous question, right? So there's no curse of dimensionality here where D enters not here, but on, on, on the, uh, on, on the uh, numerator. The reason is because this is a linear functional. So we could look at its effect on each of these dimensions separately and add all the, all the errors together, right? They don't interact with each other. And, and, but in, in nonlinear cases, this is no longer true. So this is why we don't see this curse of, the, curse of dimensionality in, in the linear case. However, there is another curse of mem uh, uh, dimensionality here. Uh, we call it curse of memory. So remember we have asked, uh, we, we have assumed in our results that this H star's memory must decay like the exponential. However, if you look at our density result, the density results doesn't require this, this kind of uh, assumption. So that means that uh, I'm not including all the functions I can approximate uh, in my rate result. The natural question is what if my target relationship doesn't decay like the exponential? For example, if it decays like uh, t to the minus omega, where omega is some power, and this power, let's say, approaches zero. So these are perfectly good functionals, and they are still, you know, the RNN can still approximate up to arbitrary degree, uh, arbitrary error. But what we can show through a truncation argument is that we, we actually need to get to error epsilon, we actually need an exponentially large number of, uh, of, 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 of uh, neural network nodes, M, okay? The size of my uh, hypothesis has to be exponentially large in, in omega uh, for, for this to work, okay? And this is very much like the curse of dimensionality, except this time it's on the, 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 the decay rate uh, of your target relationship. And then we coin this curse of memory. And this is uh, something we can show that uh, occurs in recurrent neural networks, even in the linear case. And the key insight here is that uh, efficient approximation of uh, your functional is, is possible if it's smooth and has some exponentially decaying memory structures. Okay, and, and it turns out you can also prove the converse that says that if you assume that you have efficient approximation of some target using RNNs, then that target under certain conditions must possess some exponential decaying memory. So in some sense, it's if and only if the H star is, uh, is, is, has small memory and this memory can be made precise. Uh, and, and we also show in, in, in these works that the related curse of memory also holds when you're optimizing the recurrent uh, neural networks, that the kind of plateauing behavior that we saw, you, you can formalize that as well. Uh, I will not talk too much about this. So in some sense, why this is the case, uh, you know, heuristically is because the recurrent neural network architecture itself has some exponentially decaying memory, right? So your target should be compatible with that property for it to be able to approximate it well, okay? So that's the, the take home message. And this is a recurring theme for, for all of these results I'm gonna talk about. 
Okay, so that's all I say about the approximate results for uh, recurrent neural networks. And then I think I will talk about the convolution case, and then uh, maybe we can skip the last uh, um, and, oh, I encoded decoder case or talk about the main results. Yeah, yes. Question on uh, on this, just so that my understanding is is, is correct. So if if you can go back to the slide where you have the the, the kernel, you know this uh, this memory kernel in there. So the problem seems to be that you exponentially weigh down past events, right? You have the e to the w s. Is that? Yes. There's a weighting through this e to the w s of past events, and you know that 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 screws us. But what if we if if we uh, uh, you know sort of make it Markov by um, you know, training on, uh, are you familiar with Tarkin's embedding theorem? So this is the delay delay embedding, is it? Uh, then yeah. you should be able to do it again, right? And then would that would that get you around this curse of uh, of memory? That's a good question. So, so, okay, so maybe we can go back to the RNN architecture to address this. So if you look at the RNN architecture, right? So if we look at this Y, uh, this Y would depend on everything before this, right? Uh, and the recurrent neural network basically makes this Markovian, this Markovian by introducing a hidden state. So we have a large hidden state that is used to memorize this information here. And then um, we can then measure it. So here you are kind of turning a part, uh, fully observed uh, uh, non-Markovian system into a partially observed Markovian system because H is Markovian, right? But you, we only observe a part of it through this transformation. And I, I think what you're proposing here is that instead of feeding in x0, x1, x2, for example, each point I can fit two, one, zero, and mm -hmm. then one, zero, minus one, and, 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 and feed it like that, right? So yes. I, I think you, this, the, the length at which you do this will definitely change the memory structures that this is eff effectively representing. Uh, in practice, people do that um, for, let's say, LSTM. And, people do observe that there is some good performance uh, doing so, but we don't have a concrete analysis of uh, you know, how that embedding number actually changes the complexity of the, 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 uh, the structure. But my feeling is that um, if you have a finite number of embedding, um, it would not be fundamentally different from increasing the width of this one, mm -hmm. right? Because if you increase the width of this one, you can in fact have additional uh, terms that literally just um, just remembers these values, right? So it copies the values forward, and then you will have the same effect, isn't it? So I would say that if you have a finite embedding size, you it will be e equivalent to increasing the number of hidden uh, nodes, at least from the approximation theory point of view. But it might be easier to train. Okay, thank you. Can I ask you a question there as well? Actually, exactly about the same uh, slide. So suppose you have like that. So you have the curse of memory. Now the question is like, can the, the nonlinear functional sigma um, take care of that? Uh, so we don't have a concrete uh, theoretical answer yet, but empirically, no. So the, the uh, results I showed you, uh, previous empirical results, you can, uh, we can verify that the same thing pretty much happens in both the linear case and nonlinear case. Um, mm -hmm. The reason is the following. So if you look at this, this nonlinearity, right, it, it changes the dynamics for sure, but it does not fundamentally change the memory patterns that this can uh, achieve. So for, mm -hmm. If you think about this sigma being a tench function, right? And if this H is stable, it goes to near zero, then this is pretty much a linear function, mm -hmm. right? And its decay pattern is exponential, right? And if it is away from this, uh, this, this, this point, then you know, the dynamics will be different from a linear function, but fundamentally it does not really gives you a different kind of decaying pattern, or at least it's not clear <laughs> how you can give you a diff different decaying pattern. And experimentally, we find that the pattern is the same. So now we are trying to uh, analyze this system. There's some uh, previous work in reservoir computing on uh, analyzing these systems. What I think the basic conclusion was, as far as I can see, uh, it behaves either like a linear system, or extremely chaotic, where it cannot really approximate uh, some uh, relationships well. So uh, it, it, empirically, it doesn't change. So this is different from adding uh, nonlinearity in the neural network case, uh, fee-forward neural network case, because fee-forward neural network, the nonlinearity is added in an intermediate layer where you can then expand the nodes uh, to approximate arbitrary function. That means if I put a nonlinearity here and expand the dimension of W and then shrink it back 
So then this will be a neural network that approximates a general function of H and X. Then I would say that that can change the, uh, the memory structures. Okay. Yeah, but, but mm -hmm. that means replacing this by a deep, uh, like a wide neural network, for example, with mm -hmm. sufficient number of nodes. That might change the memory pattern. But this is not what people do in practice for recurring neural networks. Okay, thanks. Um, I have one more question. Oh, please. Um, so if I'm understanding correctly, the memory dependence needs to decay exponentially in order for us to be able to approximate well. Can you give an a, a example of a sequence to sequence mapping problem where the memory dependence is um, exponential? Yeah, so um, for example, uh, if I have a, um, like a, the input sequence is, the output sequence is, a, is, a, is a, that, like a smoothing of the input sequence. Uh, so this happens in the tracking of a position. So usually you have a noisy tracking uh, of a, like an uh, object that moves. What people do is to take the measurement and then convolve it with, with some kernel that decays, right? So in that case, the noisy uh, input sequence is the input and output is your, 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 your true position. That relationship will be exponential. So it doesn't, it doesn't, you don't need the, the, the movement of a particular particle a long time ago to determine its accurate position now, right? You only need a small memory. So that's one example where, where, where it's, uh, it's, it's exponential, it's likely exponential. Uh, then uh, another exa the example, on the contrary, I guess you're asking for example on the contrary as well, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So if you look at our demo, the sequence problem, this shift problem, right? Uh, this shift problem for large shifts, um, then this is uh, the, the, the memory pattern will be like zero and then a delta function that very far away, right? And that is, uh, it, it still decays exponentially, uh, you know, if you take the exponential to be large enough, but you can see that if I, if I my, my shift becomes larger and larger, this becomes harder and harder. It's harder and harder to bound like by, by exponential. So that's one example of a practice. Oh, or you can think of uh, translation problems. Um, or text-to-speech problems, right? Um, this um, uh, translation problems can have a long memory, right? Because the, the grammar could be different. Yeah, but uh, nevertheless, like to determine what exactly is the sequential relationship, uh, what, what kind of memory patterns does it have is actually quite a challenging problem. Um, uh, and, and of course, you'll be of interest to detect, uh, to, to come up with some numerical algorithm that they can test that. Uh, and then there's certainly one area that, that, that I like to work on. Okay, so maybe I'll, I'll talk a little bit about um, what is the corresponding results for convolutional networks. So here, uh, this is an example we talked before, the wave net, okay? And um, the question is, is, it, is one really better than the other? And when should we use uh, the one over the other for what applications, right? That was the, the goal. Um, so we can first write out what is this convolutional uh, architecture's uh, the definition. So for, uh, the discrete sequences where we can define this so-called, uh, here we're gonna work in discrete sequence space because convolution is more natural, this kind of discrete convolutions uh, to consider discrete indices. So we define the uh, dilated convolution as, you know, the, like the usual convolution, except this is dilation factor here L, okay? And in the, in the example before the L equals two. Um, and the dilated convolutional architecture is simply uh, the following, where your input sequence is H0, so this is like the hidden states. Instead of de uh, deriving a, a hidden state in terms of like a temporal evolution, I'm gonna evolve it according to this index K, which is the number of layers uh, of, your, of your convolutional structure, right? Uh, so this I is like the sequence index and K is the layer index. Uh, so at each layer, I'm just gonna take a, a dilated convolution with some filter, uh, with your previous layer's uh, hidden state and pass it through some nonlinear function. And of course I have many different uh, um, channels. So this MK is the, is the number of channels at layer K. And finally, my output will be the readout of my last layer. Okay, so this is the equation for that architecture that uh, we showed here. Okay, so as before, we're gonna, in order to compare the two models, I'm gonna use the same approximation. I'll say that, okay, I'm gonna set the uh, activation function to be a identity function. And then I'll have a linear functional. Uh, in this case, uh, the, we can write uh, the, the RN hypothesis space, but this time the, the, the hypothesis space complexity depends on L, the dilation factor. Uh, oh, sorry, L is a, yeah, yeah, dilation factor. And K is your um, 
number of layers and mk is your um, um, uh, the number of filters or number of uh, channels at each layer. Okay, so all of these numbers controls the, the, uh, the complexity. In fact, the total number of variables is, is given by this formula. So, and then of course, uh, the mapping between X and Y follows this kind of dynamics through the layers. And the full CN hypothesis is just taking the union of K and M. And here we consider a fixed L because in practice, usually uh, I think all, all the applications we use L equals two. So you have some fixed L. Uh, there's a dilation rate, and then you, you you just union over all possible number of layers and all possible number of channels at each layer. So once we have this hypothesis phase, then we can ask you know the same questions. Clearly, uh, each of this is going to parameterize a linear functional on on the input space, right? Because it is a convolution, uh, and each layer is a convolution comp composition of linear maps, still a linear map. So each y is going to depend on all the axes before. And in fact, you can show again a very similar result. So, oh, sorry, this should be T and T and Z. Okay, this is not R. So, let this be a, a family of continuous linear, causal, and time homogeneous functional. Now, we don't need a regular definition because our our um, sequence uh, is is discrete. Then we we again have a density result this time in, in L two. Okay. Um, but again, you know, this is just a guarantee, not that interesting. What's more interesting is what kind of functionals are easy to approximate using convolutions. So to show, you know, to, 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 to investigate this, we need to see how this uh, CNN approximation actually works. Again, we think about a linear, uh, ta a target linear functional, we use re re representation. We can show that, you know, there's some function rho that is essentially equivalent to HT sequence. Okay, and it's just a convolution. Now, CN and approximation, what it does, if you write out the equation, is that it's also approximating this rho by what we call rho hat, except that now this CN approximation is finite. The, the number, uh, so the index only goes to L to the K minus one, because you only have K layers and each layer has a dilation factor L. So the sequence of rho that you can approximate that is non-zero, uh, that you can actually adjust is only up to L to the K minus one. So this is a finite uh, approximation of this integral, this convolution. Uh, but of course, the, the, the range of it increases exponentially in layers. And furthermore, this rho hat, this kernel uh, by CN is simply a composition uh, like, uh, you know, uh, of all of the different layers uh, dilated convolutions. So this is like a rho is like composite convolution uh, kind of form. So if you look at the difference between these two, then the error comes with two parts. The first part is, of course, the part where I have a finite integral here. So everything in the tail of this guy cannot be approximated. So this error is always going to be there. So this is the tail of the re representation of my function. So this is the memory. Okay, and this is the first part is, is from zero to L to the K minus one. Here, I'm saying that I'm representing a, a finite signal by a composition of convolutions. Now you can see this is a bit different already. So the memory term, it's definitely uh, going to be uh, you know, positive, right? So we, we can't do anything about this memory, but the problem is that the, the index is L to the K. So built into the architecture already, there is a way to get rid of the memory exponentially fast. Okay, so if you have a very deep convolution network with some finite L, then you can get rid of memory very quickly. And this part is the interesting part. It says then you know, for a finite signal now, what kind of uh, signals, what kind of row will be very easily approximated by a composition of convolutions? Now to see how this works, uh, we can simply take an example, okay? So let's take the one dimensional case, D equals to one, so the input is one dimensional. And then I have a filter uh, size, uh, sorry, the dilation size equals to two and, um, and the filter size equals to two. And the K is the number of layers also two. So you can see that now our convolution filter only has four numbers, L to the K, it has four numbers. So suppose we have some target functional uh, whose representation is a, is a vector rho, rho H, and we only care about the first four coordinates because everything after that is a tail that we cannot do anything about. And the first, coordinate, uh, first four coordinates, what we can do is to represent them in the matrix. Okay, so zero, one, two, three, I just write it like that. And this is, in general, we call it a tensorization procedure because we can take a, a vector and arrange them into a higher order uh, tensor. In this time, in this case, it's just a matrix. 
Now, if we look at our neural network, so this is our target, right? It's a matrix. And if you look at our neural network, if we, we only use one channel, then the, our row head is just the convolution of two filters. And if you tensorize this convolution, it's, it's basically the outer product of these two filters. Okay. And since we know that the outer product is always rank one, sorry, the outer product is always rank one, then we know the following. If this tensorization procedure, so if I arrange my target uh, sequence into a matrix, if it's rank one, then of course I can exactly represent it using one filter, right? This is this two filters in one channel. And if it's not rank one, it's rank two, then the best possible approximation I can get is basically uh, given by SVD, right? I take a single value decomposition and I take the principal component, and then the second eigenvalue will be the error. And that's the optimal one. In fact, this is proved by uh, Eckhart Young. Uh, theorem. So the best rank one approximation of this guy is essentially what we can get with one channel. Now, of course, if you have two channels, then of course, any rank two matrix, matrix can be exactly represented by, by our, our network. So what this tells us is that if we are given some limited capacity in my network in terms of number of convolution filters, number of channels, then if we tensorize the target uh, signal, and if the tensorized signal has some low rank property, then we can approximate it very easily. Otherwise, it will be difficult. So that's, that's, that's the takeaway. And we can generalize this, uh, this kind of tensorization procedure uh, to, to arbitrary uh, number of layers. And, and when you have more than two layers, this, this will be a true tensor in terms of, in terms of uh, if you use three layers, it will be an order three tensor and four layers of order four tensor because you have to arrange them in the, in the right way. So I'm not going into details of this except to show you what the result says. So this tells us, uh, motivates us to define a complexity measure of my target relationship. So if I have some, some H, how can I measure its complexity? I'm gonna measure its complexity by the rate of decay of this singular values of this tensorization uh, of, of, this, uh, of, of this representation. So if I arrange them in a matrix or in a tensor, I define some generalized uh, notion of singular values. And if it decays very quickly, then that signal is of low, complexity. And if it decays very slowly, then it's of high complexity. And if it decays very quickly, then I can show that I, I can approximate it using my recurrent neural network, oh, sorry, my convolutional neural network with fewer nodes, fewer number of filters, and vice versa. Okay, so this theorem basically says that I can define a family of uh, functions, uh, functionals whose tensorized singular value decomposition has very fast decay. Now, if it has this fast decay, then I can give you a approximation rate in terms of the decay of that uh, singular values. Okay, so this is what he's saying basically, and uh, uh, and, and yeah, this is, this is what he's saying basically. And of course, you have an error term in terms of the tail that vanishes exponentially as your number of layers increase. Okay, um, so I, I'm happy to explain more if you have detailed uh, questions about this, but that that's basically the takeaway. So the question is: Is recurrent neural network or convolution neural network better? So the answer here, at least in the linear case, is neither. So RN works well if your race representation has some fast exponential decay. And CN works well if your row H has some low rank if you tensorize them according to your network architecture's uh, specification. And one can show certain sufficient conditions that this has low rank. For example, if your race representation is sparse, okay, that means most of it is zero and some parts of it is non-zero, it doesn't really matter where they are. Uh, this is going to have low tensorization rank. So, for example, if my risk representation is like a smoothly decaying one, this will be very good for RNN, but this might not have low rank under, under truncation and tensorization, so CN doesn't really work well for this. And vice versa, if you look at this one, this one certainly has high memory because this thing doesn't decay exponentially, or at least you need a very big exponential uh, for it to, 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 to decay. But uh, this has very, uh, very, it's very sparse, and we can show that this has very low rank. Okay, so this sort of explains why we observe in the demo that the shift sequence, which, which is essentially this, the shift uh, relationship is much easier uh, to be learned by CN and RN, and why the Lorentz system is, is better captured by RN and CN. Okay, so that, that, that's what we can understand from here. And I will skip the last part because I mean, uh, uh, I think it's, the, the idea is similar, and we can also do the same for encoder decoder kind of architectures. And we can show that in this case, um, there is a, um, 
again a relationship between uh, the target signal and some uh, sorry, target relationship uh, property. And this key property depends on encoder decoder architecture as well. Uh, and, and we can um, we can show that that property roughly corresponds to the fact that this relationship between the input sequence and output sequence has some uh, low rank under uh, proper orthogonal decomposition, which is the uh, the uh, the uh, infinite dimensional version of SVD. Okay, so I, I think I will skip this in case there are some questions, and then if if not, then uh, I, I can I can talk briefly about this. Maybe uh, don't want to drag on for too long. Um, so to summarize, what we what we uh, talk about today was some basic mathematical setting that allows us to precisely analyze how this architecture is different from one another and when you should use what, right? So from the approximate viewpoint, what we can show is that although all of them are dense in, in, in appropriate functions, functional spaces, uh, RNN specializes at exponential decaying memory structures. CNN specializes in low rank structures on some tensorization procedure. And the recurrent uh, encoder decoder that I, I skipped, they, they, uh, they have some low rank uh, structure under temporal products. And if my target have all of these properties, uh, each of these properties, then we should use that particular uh, model. So the overall uh, insight is that we need some structural compatibility between the model that we're using to learn the target and the target itself. Okay, and we can formalize in each of these uh, settings. Okay, so with that said, I'll, I'll conclude here and I'm happy to answer any questions. I have a question quickly, immediately again, Please. similar to before. Now, all your results are based on um, on, on, on the linear uh, type of the model, you know, whatever it was, which is great because obviously you can do all the analysis, but that begs immediately a question. So why are there the non-linearities in there, you know, like to start with in all these different kinds of models and how necessary are they? I mean, in, from a general point of view, or do they just do sometimes uh, some kind of a good job or is there something we can say about non-linearities uh, needed to to improve you know significantly like the the output yeah so um yeah, thanks for the question so first of all like the linear case is definitely for for analysis sake right because um, um in practice linear networks will not be able to model essentially any relationship that's not linear <laughs> so uh the, its capacity is limited so uh, that's we definitely don't use linear networks in in that case uh but a lot of these qualitative findings we we, we find here somehow they all hold for the nonlinear case that we tested. Like for example, these memory structures and also this sparsity structure. So we, we, in the papers, we, of course, we do the analysis in linear case, but we test it on both linear and nonlinear case. And the results seem similar. So it, it, my, my intuitive understanding is that, you know, a lot of these patterns that we talk about is in a temporal direction. So a lot of this property, like for example, uh, this property, the temporal direction is the horizontal direction, right? And a lot of this uh, nonlinearity, they work point-wise either in the, in the horizontal direction or, or in the CN case, it works in the vertical direction. So this actually doesn't, the, you apply the nonlinearity this way, but here the structure is still the same, whether you have nonlinear or linear. So I feel that the temporal structures, they, they are mostly inherent and they are not really changed that much by the, by, by the nonlinearities. So that's, that's why I think it's possible that why the results that we derive from the linear case seems to hold qualitatively for the nonlinear case, sometimes quantitatively. Um, but with that said, uh, of course, a complete theory uh, will, will, will be able to, uh, should, should handle the nonlinear case. In that case, the, the most difficult part is that um, you cannot really consider all nonlinear functionals because that, that object is just too unwieldy. Um, that, so the challenge is what kind of nonlinear functionals should one be looking at that is relevant to applications? Right, and if we, if we we fix that family on nonlinear functionals, then we can talk about all, all of these results in that context. But just to summarize in that context, so you're saying like because of the linear structure, you know, results you found with respect to memory or not, then you would say that the corresponding nonlinear version will basically inherit the same issue. At, at least that's what we find in experiments. And in fact, I mean, the motivation of this sequence of work is the nonlinear experiments that people have done. Yeah. And, 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 and we show that the linear case also has that those issues and which we can clarify. So experimentally, yes, um, it also happens in nonlinear case. Mm -hmm. But Thank theoretically, you. I don't have a good answer as to, mm -hmm. to, to why <laughs> at the moment. Oh, can I just ask you, 
quickly a follow up uh, in a different context. So, or maybe that there's a reason which also relates to the question in the in the uh, in the chat. But so you, you're taking the the continuum limit, like you know, like uh, for for the for the RNN. And so, is there some kind of a because you take the continuum limit? Can I say something about how deep my 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 layers have to be? You know, in a discrete setting. You know, in some sense like that. When I go back to a normal uh, network based uh, on your continuum results, is there anything I could say? I mean, so I can't is, see how. But <laughs> is is this on the uh, the recurrent network or the on the feed forward network that I briefly mentioned in one slide? Because the answer would be different. Uh, in the recurrent network. I'm mm -hmm. taking the continuum limit in this direction, mm -hmm. right? But technically, uh, there's no number of layers in this direction because the recurrent neural net goes on forever, right? It's yes, a, that's it's, what I'm saying. So you a, couldn't give any statement in this case, I think, you know. Yeah, because it's, there's no well-defined yeah. number of layers. But of course, mm -hmm. um, uh, we can we can argue that um, if you take a recurrent uh, discrete recurrent neural network uh, in the form of a residual form, then for um, so here, right? So here. Okay, so this one is a non-residual form, but if you take, yeah. you, if you add HK plus some delta T here, and then mm -hmm. as delta T go to zero, this should converge in the usual sense. Yes. Um, and it's Hurwitz, so the conversion will be uniform uh, mm -hmm. in, 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 in the usual sense to the ODE system. Now, um, I think the related question in the chat is like the difference between this kind of neural uh, ODE mm -hmm. Uh, and, and, and the uh, dynamics. So for example, in this paper, we study that feed-forward problem. The feed-forward problem does have a well-defined number of layers, right? Uh, in that case, uh, what we can show uh, in, in here is that um, if you prove some approximation guarantees for the continuous system, then any um, uh, consistent discretization of it will also inherit that density result. Um, that's, that's, that's true, right? So that, that's, you know, that's just a numerical analysis result. Uh, but what, the rates need not be that simple, right? So because rates, we, we talk about complexity of a network. Uh, and in the continuous time, the trainable parameters with a, a function of time is a measurable function of time, uh, which in itself, you cannot really count the number of parameters, right? It's infinite. Uh, so uh, it is hard to quantify the rates uh, and the difference between those two. And so the differences in performance empirically um, if you use a, a kind of dynamical system kind of uh, formulation, you will be very similar to residual neural networks, which is the state of the art. And um, changing the step sizes does affect the results uh, a little bit, uh, but we don't know how to ultimately choose the step sizes. It's certainly not going to be the same as the numerical analysis kind of stuff. Because numerical analysis, we are talking about how to discretize the system to be close to the to a target continuous system. But here is how to describe a system. So it's, so this flow map is close to a target function. And, and this is a two different problems. Uh, and, and, and we don't have a lot of theoretical understanding of this. There are some recent work on how to choose step sizes. Uh, they may, may be of interest. Thank you. And Chow, I was really fascinated by, so this is a little bit off topic, but I was fascinated by your training curve that has this long plateau and then uh. deeply descends again. And I was wondering if you could say a few words about your theoretical understanding of that. The, this curve uh, here is what we observe first in the nonlinear system. Okay, and then this is uh, it's very interesting. And people, you know, who have trained RNs must have seen this at some point. Um, it happens very often, but it doesn't happen all the time. So the first challenge to that problem is that can I identify a case where this happens uh, for sure? <laughs> and then I talk about in that case, how does the length of the plateau depend? On, uh, on, on this uh, configuration. Okay, so what we discovered uh, in, in, this, uh, in this work here, um, in this work here, and this is the longer version, but in the earlier paper, uh, I, can, I can show you to you later. So we can think of a target functional uh, that whose risk representation has two paths. One is at zero. So it's a spike at zero. But I'll show you, that there might be a picture here. We, we're gonna, we consider some simplified setting, but I'm trying to see if I can find. Okay, so here, we're gonna assume, uh, we found that there's one way to reproduce this result uh, every time. So the idea is that we assume that the ground truth risk representation, so this is the linear function we're trying to learn, has two parts. One row bar, which is very nice, kind of exponential uh, decaying function that you can, you can easily approximate, okay? Using recurrent. And you have another one that is like a spike that's far away. Okay, and this omega depends, uh, uh, bounces distance. So 
for example, uh, this could be a, like, a, like a Gaussian spike at um, omega. Uh, as omega goes to infinity, this part is going to go to infinity. So you can see that this is for any finite omega is an exponentially decaying function, right? But I can control the, the gap between these two. And what we found is that as you increase this gap, the plateauing will, will, will increase exponentially in omega. And the reason is actually very simple. Um, if you look at the loss function, uh, which is basically the target function and your exponential sum, which we can simplify to this form, right? Then if you look at the gradient, uh, maybe just look at the first equation. There's two parts of this gradient, right? One is uh, this term and one is this term. And the gradient is the integral of the product of these two terms. Now, this, the one in the bracket is the distance between my approximation and my row, right? It's only small everywhere if you have a good approximation. So when does plateauing happen? The plateauing happens when this term is not small. Right, because I didn't approximate it well. It's not small everywhere, but somehow this integral is small, so that it, it flattens. Right, that the gradient doesn't it, it becomes zero, so it doesn't train. So if you look at this integral, when can that happen? This this can happen precisely when the difference between my model and my target is only significant for large t, because the first term is exponentially decaying t. So if I have a very large t, so let's say they all agree for small t, but for large t they don't agree then the, the norm of this is not going to be small if you integrate over t or take supremum over t. But the integral is small because of this term. And this causes it to plateau. OK, so it has exponentially small uh, gradient. And, and then we can even show, you know, prove that the, the, the region of the plateauing depends on this, uh, this the different. So, so this is why I can write rho as a sum of something like that, which is very easy to approximate, plus something that's very far away from, uh, from time. And that's, that's why it plateaus. Hopefully, that, that, that's a heuristic understanding why that happens. A lot. That was super, super insightful. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so basically, we can identify this kind of, this, this, the, the, the construction of this is motivated by the form of gradient. So, uh, so then, you know, we can show that in this family of targets, you can, you can, you can always reproduce this result. Uh, this, then you can even have derived asymptotics for the plateauing behavior as a function of this omega. Yeah. So that's what we did in this analysis. And we call that curse of memory in optimization. I mean, is, is that similar to, Suppose you have a data set where basically like it only has, you know, at certain times it has like strong memory and then uh, in between not, then you would basically want to switch between the two. I think like in my case, I always think like of uh, multiple time scale time series, you know, where you have like relaxation. So where you have like some like very strong volatility in the data, but then you have a very long time set where basically like, you know, it goes exponentially uh, decaying quickly like to, to zero. So does it somehow say like we have to have a mix of RNN and CNN like in an adaptive way in some sense like that? I, I would think so. So it's some, mm -hmm. uh, I talked to some practitioners who, who, who do time series analysis in, in industry and what they found is that sometimes they, they have to use several models together to, to extract features and then do their sequence modeling. So uh, for example, one, one have told me that the, the best performance they got um, was actually to use some RNN, uh, CNN to extract some features and then use RNN on those features. Uh, and somehow that worked well. And I suspect that it could be because of, you know, this kind of structures in the time series. Uh, of course, and we want to cover that eventually, but, uh, you know, uh, yes, people do that in, in practice as well. <laughs> Maybe at first try and error, but uh, yeah, they, they, they do do that. And in fact, some of the architectures are also a combination. So like, for example, uh, the, the one I, the part I skipped on recurrent encoder decoder is kind of com combining the idea of recurrent neural networks and encoder decoder structures. And, and that allows us to do something that's different from, let's say, using purely recurrent network. Well, fantastic talk and thank you so much. Thank you.